Jesus is the master teacher. In Jesus' teachings, as he shared with everyone and anyone who would listen to him, he unwrapped and he unpacked deep spiritual truths. But to everyone who listened to these truths, he also presented a challenge to think about, to consider, to study, to understand these truths, and then to apply them to your individual lives. Now Jesus shared these truths and taught these truths in a variety of ways, and one of them was through parable, through the, the story. But another one was through the use of paradox. Now a paradox is a statement that on the surface at least, runs against conventional wisdom, seems to contradict itself in its statement. Yet, as a paradox is investigated and is explained and is understood, that paradox, that, I mean, that contradiction just goes away. And what is seen before you is then that which seems to be true. Now Jesus, as he used paradox in his teachings, Sometimes that paradox was in a single sentence or a single thought. Sometimes, however, the paradox came as two different teachings at two different times were laid side by side. And as they were looked at side by side, the paradox emerged. A seeming contradiction seemed to come. For those who have put their trust in Jesus, Paradoxes, in fact, draw us deeper into spiritual truth. It draws us e deeper into a relationship with God, deeper into a relationship with Jesus, because those who have spiritual ears to hear, those who have spiritual eyes to see, then run deeper into truth as these paradoxes become clear and understandable. However, for those who do not put their trust in Jesus, these paradoxes in fact confirm their unbelief. Because when they look at the paradox, they don't understand them, they don't believe them, nor do they want to follow them, even if someone were to show them how they are to live. Now when individuals come to Scripture and look at these paradoxes, find these hard or difficult sayings, there are several ways that they try to deal with them or, or even try to resolve them. One of them is by reading a paradox and believing that the Gospel writers misquoted Jesus. Part of that comes from a true statement that, well, Jesus would not contradict himself, and that is true. Jesus, as God, would never contradict himself. But here's the problem with seeing that the Gospel writers misquoted him because of these seeming contradictions. And that is this. We also believe that the Holy Spirit, through God, inspired the Gospel writers to write what they wrote. The Holy Spirit guided them writing what they wrote. In fact, Jesus said at the Last Supper that the Holy Spirit is going to come to you and He is going to remind you of everything that I have told you. And so the Holy Spirit came to them, guided them, reminded them of everything that Jesus said, and they wrote that down. And so what we have in the Gospels is in fact Jesus' words. Not misquoted, not taken out of context, but rather, these paradoxes are, in fact, what Jesus said. A second way, though, of dealing with paradoxes is to read them and pick one part and discard the other. To emphasize the part of the paradox that you like. The part of the paradox that follows your line of thinking. Part of the paradox that is easy and pick that part of the paradox and discard the hard part, the part that we don't want to follow, the part that we don't want to look at. The problem with that, of course, is we miss then the complete and total teaching of Jesus. All of it is what he taught. Both sides of the coin, as it were. The 
paradox is what Jesus wanted to share with us and takes us to a deeper understanding of how to live for him. Of course, a third way of dealing with the paradox is to skip over it completely, to pretend it wasn't even there, to, to read scripture and when you get to that hard saying, oh, oh, well, let's go on to the next verse, and, and, and to pretend it didn't even exist. But there's a fourth way of dealing with paradoxes of Jesus. And that is to read them, and to study them, and to get involved in them, and to try to understand what Jesus was trying to say, and then after we understand what Jesus was trying to say, then to apply what he tried to say to our own lives, that we might live more like him. That, over the next several weeks, is what we want to do. Over the next several weeks, we're going to look at several of Jesus' paradoxes. We're going to seek to understand what it means and then seek to apply it to our own individual lives. And so beginning today, we want to look at some of these paradoxes. And the one we're going to look at today is preparedness and providence. Preparation and planning and providence trusting in God. Now, as we think about this paradox, these two sides, to prepare and to plan and to trust in the providence of God, we actually find this paradox in a variety of teachings that, when laid side by side, seem to contradict each other. And so we need to look at these various teachings of Jesus. And so let's first look at the idea of preparedness or preparation or planning. I encourage you, if you have a Bible, to look at Luke chapter 14, verses 28 to 30. Luke chapter 14, verses 28 to 30. Jesus actually is speaking about the cost of discipleship, but he gives this good advice. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Sounds like some pretty good advice, especially as it relates to preparation and planning. For isn't it true that any of us who would want to build something, a, a house or, or a garage or a shed, or we'd want to uh, make something, or we'd want to buy something, isn't it true that the first thing we should do is check the budget? Can we afford it? Is it something that we can indeed have enough money to build or to make or to buy? And if we buy something uh, and there are payments, will we be able to sustain through our income to pay for those things? And so, of course, we need to consider the cost. We need to look at the budget. And if the answer is no, then we have two options. We don't build, we don't make it, we don't buy it, or we plan and prepare how we might be able to then afford that which we're building, making, or going to buy. Jesus is calling people to plan, to prepare. And that is good advice, not just financial advice, but it's good advice in all aspects of life. And in fact, planning and preparation was part of Jesus' life, all of his life, from birth to his ascension. In fact, his own birth was a, a, a plan of God, a magnificent plan of God. And it was prepared and planned all the way back in Old Testament times. The whole Old Testament is kind of a preparation, is a planning for the coming of the Messiah. Paul said in Galatians 4.4 4, that when the fullness of time came, Jesus was born. When all the preparations had been satisfied, when all the planning had come together, Jesus was born. That's how God works. God prepared and God planned. The whole life of Jesus was, in fact, following the plan of God, doing the will of God, doing the plan that God had laid out for him. 
setting the stage even long before his birth. And throughout Jesus' ministry, he continually checked in with that plan. He checked in with God in prayer to make sure that he was still following that plan. And what was the plan for today, the next week, maybe even the next month? He continued to check in. And Jesus' journeys throughout his ministry were not just random uh, shots in the dark, going here, going there, just for chance. But no, they also were planned. Consider John chapter 4. Beginning of John chapter 4, John wrote, And Jesus had to go through Samaria. There were other routes. There were a lot of routes to get up to Galilee. Why did he have to go? Because there was a plan. The plan was for him at noon, at lunchtime, to meet a woman at the well. She didn't know that that was the plan. But Jesus knew that that was the plan. And so he had to go through Samaria so he could meet with her. But that was the plan. Jesus, at various times in his ministry, also said, My time has not come yet. My hour has not come. But then at the end, when he's preparing and sending disciples into the city, into the town, to prepare for his last Passover meal with them, he then says, Now my time has come. All part of a plan. And that time he's talking about, of course, is his death and resurrection, which according to the plan, Paul says, was established before the foundation of the world. The plan was in place. Preparations had been made. And now, here is Jesus. The time has come for him to die on the cross, but then to be raised again from the dead so that we might have newness of life through his salvation. That's the, what we call the salvation plan. So Jesus indeed teaches and lives through word and deed the idea that we are to prepare, we are to plan, we are to make those steps as we look to the future. But then comes the idea of God's providence, trusting in God. We're supposed to plan, we're supposed to work, we're supposed to do all these things and prepare, but we're also to trust in God. Let's look at some of those scriptures. Matthew chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. This is the story of Jesus sending the disciples out on a missionary journey. And he said to them this, Do not take along any gold or silver, or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey, no extra tunic, or sandals, or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there, and stay at his house until you leave. Here is Jesus sending out his disciples on a missionary journey in which they will preach, in which they will teach, in which they will heal the sick, in which they will cast out demons. And he says, make no preparations for your journey. Don't pack a bag. Don't take extra money. Don't, don't take food. Don't take anything. Just what you're wearing and you just go right now and trust in God. Trust that God will lead you to a proper house where they, will, where they will provide for you the things that you need. If you need an extra tunic, they will supply that for you. If you need some money, they will supply that. Food, shelter, take nothing with you. Just right now, go trust in God. How many of us would do that? If right now, in your home, we have to stay at home. Okay, but when this is all over, and someone says to you, just go and trust in God, how many of, of us would do that? But that's what the, Jesus was telling the disciples. Right now, he maybe even gave them no warning. Said, okay, I want you to go on a missionary journey. Right now, go. Take nothing with you. Trust 
in God. No planning, no preparation. Where are we going? Just go. Trust in God. Another passage earlier in Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 26, Jesus taught this in the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father leads them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Later on, he emphasizes the key idea of this passage is don't worry. Don't worry about these things. Don't worry about your clothing, your food. God will take care of all of this. Don't worry. Trust in God. Later on, he says, seek first the kingdom. In other words, look to God, and all of this will be added unto you. Jesus is saying, trust God for all of your needs. For he indeed, as Paul says, supplies all of our needs. But then here lies the paradox, doesn't it? On one hand, on one hand, Jesus is saying, prepare, plan, work, do things. On the other hand, he's saying, trust God. He will supply all your needs. And so how do we deal with that? Well, some individuals deal with it, as I said earlier, by picking one side of it. Some, you know, and maybe it's you, you're on the prepared side. You're on the prepare, 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 plan, 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 work, work, work. I've got to do this. I've got to, you know, if I want a good future, if I want a, a, a satisfying life, I've got to do this. I've got to prepare, I've got to plan, I've got to save, I've got to do all this. There is a TV false teacher who said this, God has already done everything he's going to do. The ball is now in your court. If you want success, if you want wisdom, if you want to be prosperous and healthy, you're going to have to do more than meditate and believe. You must boldly declare words of faith and victory over yourself and your family. That's a bunch of rubbish. But a lot of people live that way, even in the church. Work, work, work. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Plan, plan, plan. I've got to do this myself. God's, God's done everything. He's busy with COVID-19. i got to do all of this. And i got to do it myself. Prepare, prepare. And so that's all they look at. And they discard the second part of the paradox. Then you have the other side. Those individuals who misunderstand the statement, let go and let God. And what they do is they sit back on their lazy boy chair and they just sit and wait for God to show up to do something for them. They lift no finger of any work or preparation planning on their own. I'm just waiting for God. I'm just trusting in God. God's going to do something. I know. He's going to knock on my door and He's going to show up and He's going to take care of me. Neither one of these has any understanding of the paradox of preparedness and providence. Because the reality of preparedness and providence, the, the paradox in Jesus' teaching, is that the reality is both of them happen together at the same time. Yet, we are to prepare, we are to plan, we are to work, but we are also to look beyond our preparations and our planning and work and trust in God. We need to stop trying to control our situation, but rather plan and prepare and allow God, who's in control of all things, put our trust in Him to control the outcome 
of even that which we have prepared and planned. And so as we think of this idea of preparedness and providence, the paradox, we need to believe and understand that what it really has to do with is a cooperation and a continuing providence. St. Augustine put it this way, Pray as though everything depended on God. Work as though everything depended on you. That is the paradox. Pray as though everything depended on God. Work as though everything depended on you. The Christian life is a combination of divine and human activity working together at the same time. Time. We are called to do something. We are called to prepare. We are called to plan. But in the midst of our preparing and planning, we also need to be trusting in God, who is in control of all things. And we need to trust that even in the midst of our preparation and our planning, His will, His perfect will, will carry us through all and every situation. James wrote it this way in James chapter 4, <clears throat> beginning at verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. The end of that talks about the preparedness. It talks about planning. He says at the end there, he says, we will live and do this or that. That talks about preparation and planning. But in the beginning, he says, if it's the Lord's will, they go hand in hand. We need to prepare and plan. But we need to prepare and plan, always thinking and always asking, is this the Lord's will? Is this the plan he wants us to go? And when we make that plan, then we move forward still trusting in Him for the outcome. I think as we find ourselves in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it is a wonderful illustration of this paradox. Think back for a moment of February, January, maybe even December. We were making plans for the future. We were making plans for this time. Some of you, even here in April, had made plans to go on vacation. One of our members, were, they were going on a cruise around Easter time. Some were making plans for other gatherings for Easter. Some were making plans a little farther in the future for, for events, uh, Mother's Day, proms, graduations. Some of us were making plans here in the church for creation. All kinds of plans being made. It's December, January, February. My question is, were we trusting in God as we made those plans? Because you see, God knew what was coming. We didn't, but God knew what was coming. And when it came, and when the virus came, and when mitigation came, all of those plans, or at least most of them, went right out the window. But you know what didn't go out the window? God. God in his providence. God in his sovereignty. God is still here. Yes, we were, it was good that we made plans. But those plans always go by what God sees and what God wills in his direct or his permissive will. Because you see, God is still here. He's still providing. He's providing for scientists, researchers. He's providing for medical people. He's providing wisdom and guidance for uh, government officials, whether you agree with them or not. He's still providing guidance. He's providing guidance for you and I as we seek to remain calm, remain home, 
remain safe, and remain praying. God is still here. And even now, in the midst of all of this, we still need to be planning and preparing for the future. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like. And so some of our plans are plan A, and then there's plan B, and then there's plan C. But we still need to be preparing and planning for the future. But while we do that, we need to still be trusting in God and asking God, what should we be doing? What should we be thinking? And leaving the control of the future in His hands. Leave the outcome of the future in His hands. Make our plans and preparations, but always understanding if it be the Lord's will. This past week I, I read this statement. Since it depends on God, we can let it go. We can work hard, but leave the outcome up to Him. If God is in charge, we can tolerate mixed results and even endure failure. God is in control. We need to make plans. God's given us a mind to make plans and to prepare. But we always need to be doing it with His will in mind. Always surrender to His will as we make our plans. Are we trusting in Him? We've made this plan. Let's trust in Him for how it will work out. And maybe it won't work out the way we wanted it to, but we know from Paul's words it will work out for the good. Romans 8, 28. For those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And so my hope is during this time when we let go and let God do it. I hope what we're saying is that we will make some plans and prepare, but all along we will trust in God for the future. And if we do that, I believe we then have grabbed hold of Jesus' paradox about preparation and promise. Two things working together the same time. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we are in a difficult times and the frustration is, is that many of our preparations and plans that we had made and still continue to make are, are not working out, but we know that all things will work out for your good and for your glory. In the midst of our frustration, in the midst of our anxiety, God, we ask that you would help us through your Holy Spirit to be reminded that you are still in control, to trust in you, even as we continue to plan and to prepare. God, we thank you for being with us as you have promised. We pray for each one who is listening to this sermon, that you will lift up their spirit, that you will take hold of them, and that you will show them your providence, your sovereignty, and your love. God, I pray if there is anyone who does not know Jesus Christ, that even now, as we finish this prayer, you will speak to their heart. Show them, in the midst of their despair, their frustration, their anxiety, that you are in control, and that you love them, and that Jesus the Christ died for them on the cross, that they might have life and have it abundantly, even in the midst of difficult times. I pray that they would accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, even now. God, we give you the praise, we give you the glory for all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.